Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you are uh, in this world. Uh, so here, yeah, for the next um, 50 minutes or so, we're going to talk again about uh, OWASP uh, API threats. And, and this time we you know, decided to also relate it a bit more to um, what 42 Crunch is, is doing. But um, as you will see, there's a lot of information also in the presentation about you know, the, the type of problems that are described in, in OWASP top 10 in general and how to address them with 42 Crunch in particular. Um, so it will be no surprise to any of you that that API breaches are already on the rise. This is um, going on again and again and, and again. We've been able every single week for the past two years now to report breaches on on API Secure.io. Um, so it, it's just it's not getting better. Let's put it this way. Uh, so just at the public ones. Now, if we look at why this is happening, right? It's it's mostly four things, and and usually it's actually a combination of things. Um, the lack of, you know, input validation. So we're kind of trusting too much what the data uh, coming our way is and where it comes from and who is sending it. Um, not enough rate limiting or badly configured rate limiting, um, depending on the type of operations that we are protecting. Data and exception leakage, and this is mostly what we will talk about today, and, and also authentication and authorization issues. So, so this is kind of the, the highlights. And you know, everyone is concerned. The largest, the biggest uh, companies are. Um, so we, we, what we wanted to do in this presentation is, is kind of showing you some examples, some different examples as well, and some I'm using usually, and, um, and see how we address those. Um, so um, in the OWASP top 10, so we have 10 issues, as you can imagine, from 1 to 10. Um, and as we said, this webinar is a two-part one. Um, just to make things more interesting, instead of saying we're going to do 1 to 5 today and 6 to 10 next time, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk first about anything related to data and systems. So anything you see here in orange. So that's excessive data exposure, API 6, 7, 8, and 9. And the ones in white are the ones we will be covering next time. OK? So we're going to focus today really on, on data access, data validation, um, and, and you know, why this is important in, in all those uh, typical bridges. OK. So let's start with the first one, which is API 3 excessive data exposure. So what does that mean? Basically, that means we are exposing too much data back uh, to client application through our APIs. Um, and, and the roots of that problem really lie in the change of architecture from going from an application structure where everything was done on the server side. And therefore, when we were exposing data through you know, a web service or any kind of API of that sort on the back end, we were just exposing them to another layer, which was also an internal layer. And that would be like the, the, the application layer, our application server, or something on the server side, not, not on the client side. So all this exchange was happening within uh, our enterprise. And then when we had the answer, we will send back some HTML, maybe with some JavaScript, back to the client. But that interaction between you getting the raw data and you work with that data and you massage it and you and, and you filter it, et cetera, what was happening on the server side. But now with APIs, all of that is happening client side. So we tend to have very, very rich clients. Should it be mobile application or should it be web applications, which can actually uh, take the information and, and are powerful enough to do all this work that we were doing on the server side. but within the browser now or within uh, within our phone. Um, so it's it's not a surprise that this is actually very near to the top uh, of the list of problems. And you can see there's a bunch of you know, um, companies here that we have alighted for some reason. And actually, I, I read this on, on, on a journalist page also. There's like, of those eight examples I have in, in there, four of them are dating apps uh, of different sorts. Um, so it seems like, you know, there's a lot of uh, attacks and, and problems in this type of applications. And actually, we're going to use one of them, um, Grinder, Grinder, uh, uh, you know, um, one uh, as an example of an account takeover. So what happened here? Uh, so this is something that has been reported by a gentleman called Troy Hunt. 
if you don't know Troy Hunt, you probably should, uh, is a gentleman between, be, behind uh, the I've Been Pawn uh, website, the one that allows you to check if your email is, is somewhere down on, on, on the dark web, has been stolen as part of some kind of breach. Um, it can also validate that your password has actually been is somewhere in, in, in those um, in the dark web as well and used for credential stuffing, for example. So a very, very young person um, who has written this, this uh, uh, report on, on how this attack is basically happening. And it's very simple. Actually, it, it's the simplest thing ever. Uh, all you need to know is the email address of somebody that might be on Grindr and, and you'll be able to basically take over their account extremely easily. And the reason is, um, that in the API call to do your password reset, the actual reset token, so when usually when we do a password reset, we generate a token, that token is sent through email to the user um, to prove that you know, it's them who have done this request and only them can input that reset uh, token and then they can reset their password. But in this case, for some reason, uh, the reset token was actually sent back in the response of the API. So as you can imagine, then it's very easy. All you have to go is to um, the password reset page, put that reset token in, change the password, and you're that person. Um, and there's actually very <laughs> delicate data on that application, as you may imagine. Actually, Grinder got some problems some years ago because there were um, leaking uh, uh, HIV uh, status for people on, on their on their site. Um, so you know, very big problem here. So we really have to take care about our responses, and this is all about that. API three really is all about knowing the data that we are going to return back through our APIs, and and not only knowing it but controlling it. Right, so we, we, we have to be very careful to not send back information that is, and, and hope that the client is gonna do their job as they were doing before. Simply because I can open the, which is exactly what um, Troy did, open the dev tools in, in, in my browser and, and see all this traffic uh, of the APIs. And even if they don't show up in the UI, it's extremely easy to go and uh, to get to that data. So, and of course, in that data, we have to be very careful about not sending back tokens. That's the typical example, uh, some sensitive data, some PII data, etc. So there's no really magic answer here in terms of, of uh, fixing the deep issues, except that we need to understand and, and control what is the data I have, how do I return it, uh, is that allowed in a response or not? So we need control. We need governance of that of that information, right? Um, and there is another aspect to that that I always tell to to customers as well is it's much easier, of course, to just have one endpoint and one operation that returns all kinds of data and that can be used in multiple cases. Uh, it will be used because I want to see the profile of the user. It can be used because I just want to see a little part of the profile. So there's this very typical problem that Uber got where they were sending back 100 you know, lines or 150 lines of JSON uh, in, in an API that was getting the, the profile of a driver or any user of the platform. Like, obviously, no UI is going to show so much data. But the reason probably they were doing this way is then, you know, it's easier, whatever data you need, just make that call and you pick up whatever you want, right? So it is easier from a development perspective, that's for sure. However, we should really, you know, have various and APIs and endpoints and different operations depending on the data that we want to expose. And, and depending on who is going to consume that as well. Um, I don't know if you were on, on, some of you were on the webinar that we did with Keith um, um, from Okta um, uh, a few weeks ago, but one of the, the stories he always tells, and it's, it, this is very true, which is we start writing an API for internal consumption, so we don't care. We, if we expose all the data, it's just for us, right? But then suddenly over time, that same API becomes, oh, could it be cool if we expose that to our you know, special partners. And over time, it's going to be, oh, can, you know, this is really a cool API. Can we expose it to, 
everyone. And that API has not been designed originally for that. So we, if, if every time the consumer is changing, we have to go back to the drawing board and, and look at our API and say, okay, is this data we're returning now something we're comfortable returning to all those people? If the answer is no, uh, then we have to create another endpoint, okay? Um, and if any of you out there is doing um, and using GraphQL, um, be careful there as well, because uh, you, you have to be careful to make sure that if somebody is asking uh, for some specific data through a GraphQL query, you don't return everything that they're asking for, right? So just control what is the data that people can ask for uh, through a GraphQL query, okay? Now, um, Another aspect of that, which might be uh, over, you know, uh, not really um, so obvious, is JWTs as well. Um, because in a JWT, you really you can put a JSON Web Token, you can really put a payload um, inside uh, this, this dot. And as you can see, this is, a, you know, obviously a, a bad example, an extreme example from, from this Pixie I always use, which is a by default and on purpose. Um, an API, which is a, a bad one and, and a vulnerable one. But I've seen that with, with some customers as well, where, you know, what we do is say, okay, well, we'll put some data in there that the client can consume or the, the backend can consume to actually, you know, extract some information and, and do something out of it for, for authorization purposes or any kind of purpose, right? So be careful not to put so much data and this type of information in, in a jot, right? Um, one of the recommended best practice basically is that if you wanna use jots, um, you should really use opaque token uh, to the outside world. Um, also, one of the things that, that, uh, that I've seen at, other, at customers as well is if you, if you send back to a client uh, some data within a jot, they're gonna use it. So the day you want to remove it, you're stuck, right? Because they have written some business logic and some information on the client side based on the contents and the payload with the jobs. So instead of doing that, you know, um, just use a, a no pay, a pay token for external consumption. And when the token is passed to you, go back to an IDP and transform that opaque token into a JWT that then your downstream services can consume, right? And in there you can put all the information you want, validate, of course, um, that you don't have PII or specific information depending on where you're sending it, but at least that data is not coming out and leaking to the outside world, okay? Now, how do we address this uh, within 42 Crunch? So in the end, um, the root, as we said, of the problem is really all about schemas and loose schemas and, and missing information. Uh, so not controlling basically our responses, right? So if I switch now, so I'll just uh, for each of those, I'll switch back and forth between demo mode and, and presentation mode. Um, if I look at, um, at my um, product in here, so what you're looking at right now is, um, is Visual Studio Code. So for those of you who don't know what we do, um, the core of the um, functionality within 42 Crunch is centered around uh, open API swagger and, and enforcing and hardening open API um, uh, contracts, API contracts, right? And then use that along the life cycle of the API um, to enforce um, and make sure that we have a proper implementation and then we have proper protection and we'll go along all of this. So the first tool that we have in the platform is something we call the audit. And what the audit is doing is going to look at your definition, your open API definition, and analyze it along a number of, of axes, right? Um, so I have this file here uh, called pixie.json. This is my sample API. I will click on that button here that says 42 crunch. And what this will do is it will um, actually uh, return me an audit score of, uh, of my API, which in this case is 45. So what does that mean? As you can see here, so let me just switch here so we can look at that data. So this, this schema, because we're talking about schemas here, right? <clears throat> this schema uh, user items is used uh, to return a list of users as part of a specific call, right? So what do we have here? Uh, first of all, first problem I can see in, in that schema 
um, is the lack of constraints around the data, right? So if I look at this ID, for example, or this picture, then what the tool is going to tell me, is going to tell me, hey, you don't have a format for this. What is it? It's a number, but what kind of number, right? And give me some constraints around this. Is this a big number or is it a small number? Um, so in this case, this is a user ID. Let's say that because we've put a number in there, um, we have like, um, we should fix that by saying we have a min, uh, minimum of whatever, 10 and a maximum of whatever, 10,000, okay, let's say. Um, so what this makes sure is, is that whenever we're going to validate against that contract, that constraint needs to be met, right? So this is something very important because, you know, if, even outside of the realm of 42 Crunch, if today you're using somewhere in your code or in another layer, you're doing some JSON-based validation, if your schemas are loose, then you're really not doing proper validation. You're going to validate on the type, of course. So if we take this example here, uh, we're going to validate on the type. Uh, but if somebody in here is leaking something like a UID or, or, or and the other way around as well, um, some some exceptions or whatever it is you're not going to stop that because well an exception is a string and uh, um, whatever you know information you may put in there is a string so it is a valid string right but now what we would like to do like here we say we have an email right what we should do there is put the definition of what is an email so that when this is being sent back, we can validate this is actually an email, right? And here I can see I have password. This is really good. No, I should really not have any passwords in there. So this is something I should remove from there, right? We don't want any passwords. So let me just uh, test that again and see if some issues will be gone now. So I have some new issues now because, oh, uh, what is going on here? Hmm. It tells me, well, you told me there is a password as required, but there's no password in here. And this is very frequent as well when I do, you know, POCs with customers, I see that a lot, that they forgot some required stuff um, in, in the list that doesn't match the list of properties anymore. But again, this is not something that they're using properly, so they don't have a tool that tells them about this, right? So, well, no, we don't want, the only thing we want in here, for example, is an email, all right? So I will go like this and fix all those issues, right? The other thing the tool is going to tell me here, which is really important, is, okay, if we have some responses to a call, so let's, let's take uh, this one, for example, where we, we see we have two potential responses for our API. One is 202 and the other one is 422, okay? So 202, I have some kind of you know, definition of a schema. I have the same problem with the other schema. It only says message with nothing more. So I should refine here what that message actually is. is. But there are two additional problems, which is here I'm defining a 422 with no body, right? So, all right, what does that mean? When, when we get a 422 response, there's nothing, there's like an empty body in it? Probably not. Probably we forgot here to attach some error response that we are returning of some sort, right? And we forgot about that. And probably what else did we forget? We probably forgot about some responses as well. So this is a place where um, a lot of the open API validators are really not doing a good job at this because the minimal uh, requirement for an open API spec to be valid is simply to have at least 200 with a description and that description can be as it is now, which is empty and that's it. And with that, you have a valid response for an API. But we all know that of course that is not true, right? If we only specify 200 with okay, that is by no means representative of what an API can actually do. So here we're gonna tell you about this as well. I'm gonna tell you, hey, you know, are you sure you didn't forget something here? Like uh, this is a get, so what happens um, if, if there is no um, <clears throat> body in, in here um, in terms of the, sorry, what happens if the, the, the definition of the data is actually wrong? Um, what happens if you have some 
um, a rate limiting probably in there as well. So we don't have any 429. And maybe you put you can put that default thing, which many people don't know about. So you can have a default response that's kind of a catch-all uh, that says, okay, whatever other type of responses I may have, this is the contents they have they need to have, right? Now, from a runtime perspective, what we will do is making sure that all of that data is enforced. So all those rules, I'm sorry, constraints are enforced from the open API file. Okay. All right. So this is this is API three. Um, I'm just going to go back to the slides and I'll go back to showing you the runtime in, in a minute. Okay. So API three. So it's all about schemas and, and, and compliance, right? Now, um, API 6 now is kind of the same thing. It's about managing your schemas and, and knowing what you have, but the other way around. This is all on, on the request side, right? Um, and this is typically, so the four companies you have there that got problems, there are very similar issues, which is to um, make myself like an administrator of the system by overriding a property I'm not supposed to be able to override automatically. So we'll look at uh, this example from Gator uh, watches. It's kind of a, a bit of an old one, but it's it's a very impactful one because um, the consequences of this were extremely bad. Um, so this is a, a smartwatch for a watch for 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 kids. Um, so it's supposed to be used for security. That's the main goal of it: is you give that to your kids, so you will know at any time where your kid is if if something happened to the kid, right? And what they were able to do there from an attack perspective was to become an administrator of the entire system with an extremely simple thing, which is what the hacker saw. And actually it's not, it's, it's the hacker had this for their kids and that's how they, they found this problem. Um, the, the gentlemen were looking at this, what he realized is looking at the data coming back from like a get profile user, right? You saw this thing called user grade set to one. And if you look at this list, it's, you know, you don't have to be very, um, it, it's pretty obvious that what they have been doing is taking all the data coming from probably a backend database and then create a an, an piece of data from that directly. So that's what you have user grade, user nickname, user boss ID, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this user grade thing says, oh, what happens if instead of user grade one, I put user grade two, that didn't change anything. So, okay, well, I'll try user grade zero. And it, came, it became instantly admin of the system and was able to see where all the kids were, which is extremely dangerous. Um, so why is this happening? Usually it happens because um, it is too easy maybe to map a backend structure to uh, to um, to an API, right? So there's a lot of libraries of frameworks out there which allow you to point to a database, create some you know API on top of it, at least some interface on top of it, and it's it's very easy. It's true. I, I mean, this simple API, this Pixie I'm using, it's using a, a MongoDB as a backend, and it's very easy. There's like two lines of code. You say you know, get MongoDB, transform that into a JSON object, you stick that JSON object into that JWT, or you stick it into a response and it's super easy to use. And same thing the other way around, right? Now, what is dangerous about this is you're creating um, a structure that you don't really validate in terms of what data you can put in it. So you can allow to actually users to put extra information in there. Right. So again, it's all about control and governance of the input data. And, and one of the key things I would recommend here is really not to use the same data structures for doing an update than for doing a read. Right. And make sure when you do a read, we'll back to this API three and six kind of go hand to hand. Make sure you don't return back to the to the client all the data, which is in the database in the form of adjacent structure, because this is extremely useful information for anybody that wants to exploit an API 6, okay? So we wanna validate all inputs. That's really what uh, we want to do here. So as you can imagine, what we can do in 42Crunch on um, the response, well, we can do also on the request, right? And now I'm gonna show you, uh, so it will be exactly the same functionality in terms of the audit. It validates equally 
the data coming in, then it validates the data coming out. Um, so we have the same report and the same problems on that user registration data than we would see on, on this response that we were looking at before, okay? So in terms of the firewall and blocking things, what does that mean? Uh, so behind the scenes, what we do is we take this open API Swagger file and we directly create a configuration for firewall from it. Now this configuration at 95, 98%, let's say, is really the open API file itself. Uh, we're not transforming that into specific rules or anything. We, we have created an engine that natively interprets um, uh, the open API file. Um, so that means there is a very straight line from taking the open API file and protecting from that open API file. So um, if I take this operation, which is register, um, so I'll show you API three and six uh, at the same time, then I will be able to see <clears throat> that um, let's do three first. So let's register a new user here so we get uh, a token. Okay. And then let's try to do this leakage here that's going to block. So let me show you what the API does uh, directly. So if I invoke this API directly, what it will do is it will leak back uh, the list of all the users, this, uh, this, um, <clears throat> this actual um, uh, schema we were looking in, in the first part of the demo that has the password, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now, remember we removed the password actually from there. Um, so what that means is when the password comes back, we'll actually block it and say, hey, we, we don't want to, to see the password in there. So instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to replace the actual response by something innocent uh, that can cannot be really exploited. Just say no on the response. We we you know bad stuff. We don't want to re answer to you, and we don't give you more than that. Than just saying that this response has been blocked. And of course, we'll do exactly the same thing the other way around. Um, so if we do uh, some assignment, so this is another part of the API which allows you to um, update your profile. As you can see here, you have this thing called is I'm in true. How do I know about that? It's because when we had the leak before, right? Actually, I still have this in there. I left it so we can have a look at it, right? So if, if I do an API um, profile on that user, I can I get all this information. I get the password and I get this field called is admin false. So even if the documentation, right, tells me, well, the other thing you can do is basically this, right? And nothing more, right? That's what the doc says. The doc says, if you want to update a user, you can only update their name and their email and nothing more, right? Well, if nothing prevents me from adding more stuff, like including in this case, the password, then I'll be able to, uh, you know, um, to change all those fields in, in, my, um, in my API in this, for this particular user. So instead, what we are going to do is ensure you actually cannot do that. And you can only call this if you remove uh, the data, which is not supposed to be there. So you can only email, you know, the, the change the email and change the name. So if I go back and look at the profile again, we will see that the email has actually changed um, and so has changed uh, the name, okay? Um, so, Again, all we do here is just enforce that schema and make sure that that schema is actually proper. Now, there's another aspect of the platform we haven't talked about yet I'm going to introduce now, which is the scan part, okay? So when we do the audit, what we do is a static analysis of that open API file, not, not a, a dynamic analysis. We don't even know where the API actually is, right? So, um, what we are going to, um, sorry, so what's going on here? All right. Um, what I'm going to show here is if we look at that report now, what is the scan doing? What the scan will do is it will automatically involve in, um, um, it will automatically call the actual API. So you give me an endpoint to invoke, and it will start to hammer the API with all kind of bad requests and bad data to see how that API actually reacts. Um, and, and one of the things we do as part of that is to, for example, making sure if you told me this is my data that comes in in register, 
we will um, not put some data, or on the contrary, try to inject some extra data. And also we will validate on the responses. So here is a very good example of that. Um, one of the things we'll do is we'll invoke the API within proper data. So this register, it's expecting a JSON structure. But here, what we are doing instead is we're invoking um, this API with just a Boolean, right? So it's expecting a full JSON structure, but all it gets is, is this true Boolean thing. That's it, right? And then what happens? Well, it's not too happy. <laughs> so it answers to that question saying, nope, sorry, can't do. Uh, here is the exception. And it returns all the exception back to the client, which is exactly what we don't want. And is the type of tests that we want to do early so we can detect this type of problems. So when the response content type doesn't correspond to the schema that we're expecting, or when the schema itself, does, the response, I'm sorry, does not uh, match that schema, we'll flag that as a problem. So that you can easily discover whether your API under stress actually is capable of um, answering correctly to all those bad data, bad formats, and, and all the things which are being sent to it, bad verbs that we'll talk about in a second, that we're sending its way, OK? So that's the scan part of it. The, typically, the thing you would do at testing phase and Q, QA phase. All right, what's next? Uh, we're at six. Next one is, all right, and this is all about security misconfiguration. So this is um, actually about, um, did I leave some, um, some default configurations, the typical admin admin and, and, and things like that on port 9200 on, on Elasticsearch or 8080 on Tomcat, right? Um, we have some open storage, which, which is not protected or, or HTTP headers, which is not correct, correctly set. So I don't have the proper um, security headers put in place or, um, or cores put in place, okay? So we have a few famous examples here. Um, we're going to talk about GitHub. This is a very a quite recent example um, where what happened was uh, they were able to bypass entirely the auth flow of GitHub. And, and the way they did that was actually pretty simple. Um, they sent a head request to the API, and that was not planned. So that is, that's not part of the API official set of verbs that you can actually use, right? But it's it's there. It's something you, you have in there. And why is it there? Because the underlying framework that they use to, to create their app, uh, which is Rails, um, actually has a default behavior for verbs that it doesn't know about, right? And, and that is something that I see in, at, at many customers as well. Um, and I'll show you that in the scan in a second, that the <clears throat> actual, API, um, you may not know from as a development from a development perspective, you may not know what the behavior of your API will be if you start invoking it with the wrong verbs, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of setup, first of all, we should really just reject anything that we don't want, right? So anything which is a non-path, non-verbs, we don't want that, right? Um, I really hope all of them, have, all of you have TLS on by default. Don't leave anything open with no TLS out there. Um, make sure you have TLS 1, 2, very strong cipher suites with it, not, not basic ones. So you can force that on, 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 most, of the, the, on most of the systems. Uh, test your endpoints. A lot of people are using SSL labs to test their websites. Uh, you should really point this to your API endpoints as well change all the default stuff. First thing you should do, automatically inject some security headers um, somewhere in the flow. So you have all those uh, protection uh, headers uh, in place, right? And then there's this whole aspect about um, maintaining your system to the latest level. So I'm, I'm a great advocate of this thing. This is really not something 42 Crunch is deeply involved in, but I see so many problems around this that this is very important to say, right? Uh, you really need to make sure that all the libraries, all the images, anything you're depending on, which is not your stuff, you know, but that your API relies on to be executed is really at the 
you know, at the greatest and latest level of code, um, just to make sure you're not using a version from like six months ago or nine months ago that is that has some known vulnerabilities. And if they are known, they are known to everyone. And that includes hackers. So once they, you know, define and find what we are using, it's going to be very easy for them to exploit those existing um, CVEs that you have in there, right? So just make sure that you, you are always up to date and test basically um, for vulnerabilities in a, in a continuous fashion, right? And there's a really great article. I really encourage all of you to read that uh, on how by simply allowing um, a poison Docker image inside a Kubernetes cluster, if that image allows you to have a backdoor um, they were able to basically exit that, that container to get at the node level and from there getting access to all the other containers that were deployed inside the same cluster. Um, I'm summarizing, summarizing quickly here, but it is, it is fascinating to see what the impact of having a bad image can have, especially in this case, if you're using a shared environment. Um, so remember that when you're in a cloud, if it's a public one, you're, you're next to a lot of other people. Uh, so if somebody got attacked, that's also a problem for you. So you, you have also to be careful there. It could become a problem for you. Um, so um, how do we address this? Well, basically, this is all about, you know, testing continuously um, the, the actual um, security of the system, right? So. The, the way we, we are um, envisioning the product here is all this audit and all this can, you want to do all of that automatically. What does that mean? That means that, for example, I can run the same audit that I've shown you running inside VS Code, but I'm going to actually see it in my, sorry, inject it in my DevSecOps, um, in my DevOps, I'm sorry, pipelines, okay? So I will just, um, uh, for example, upload and, and see all my different APIs and automatically analyze them. You know, every time somebody changes some code, I will push the code into our corporate CICD platform. Some pipeline will kick up, kick down, and then the audit will be part of that pipeline and start analyzing all the open API files that it finds for all these kind of problems. And from a security standpoint, I can put those limits and those rules on you know, what is the minimal level of security, what are my corporate security requirements that I want to enforce as part of CI CD. And really, in, in this case, automation is your friend. It's the same thing as discovering if you're using an API, uh, uh, a library, or something which is outdated. The, if, if you if you know if you're doing any serious API job, chances are you have dozens and dozens of dependencies that you need to care about. So the only way you can really make sure you have this under control is to automate all of this and make sure you actually find out um, very early if you are using something wrong before you 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 know look at this when you hit production. It may be too late to actually do anything about it, and you have to you know deploy the thing knowing there's a problem in it, and 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 run against the clock to actually fix it and and deploy a new version. So the earlier you start in 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 the life cycle to actually discover those issues. Um, the best it is. So that is why we really push, you know, and, and encourage our customers to make sure they have all this discovery and all this analysis, you know, as early as design time, basically. And in terms of uh, configuration, uh, we'll actually uh, inject and remove um, specific headers uh, as well. As you've seen, the error messages are very safe. They don't have much information in the next version, the next version, in the next part uh, of the webinar, we'll talk about uh, logging and monitoring and I'll show you those, you know, how to track back uh, this logging mechanism and, and how to create some beautiful dashboards out of that and, and create alerts out of it. Um, but I'll, by default, first of all, we block everything. Uh, we don't let anything in unless it's described by an API. Uh, the security, it's all TLS by default. It's all 1.2 with the highest ci ciphers. Um, and we'll also, you can inject some automatic policies to inject security headers um, as, part of the, as part of the execution of the policies within the firewall. 
All right, uh, moving on to injection. That's, you know, we know about that. This has been around for a very, very long time. Um, it's been number one problem for the longest time in, in traditional applications uh, for many reasons, widely exploited problems. Um, so I just took um, a recent one I found on, on Hacker One on, on the platform um, from Starbucks from, from last year, where basically this is a pretty nasty one actually, um, where um, they were able through, you know, just SQL injection, they were able to get directly to the backend production database um, and start executing shell commands on, on that database server. So they've been really nice uh, to just do a ping and nothing more, but they could have pretty much wiped out the entire database or got all the data. That was a pretty, pretty bad one. Um, so why is injection happening, right? Well, back to the same thing. It's about validation. We all know this. There's been a, a cheat sheet on OWASP forever on, on how to validate, how to mitigate injections. This has not changed for APIs. It's all about um, validating the content, um, including headers. So the, the infamous Equifax, which is there as an example, the injection came through and the remote common execution came through um, a content type. So just be very you know, careful about the input that you're ex um, ex accepting um, and, and, and check the, the, um, the behavior, yes, of your, of your frameworks, again, on that content type thing. Um, and, and again, this is back to also the bad verbs and stuff we'll talk about, we were talking about. Um, your dev frameworks are, have some built-in logic uh, on, on some of the, you know, the um, how they react to certain type of, of bad data and, and uh, being being sent their way. And, and, and that default behavior you need to know, right? And, and again, the only way you're going to need to know, you sorry, the only way you're going to know is if you test it yourself. And that's why we're providing the scan. So it does all those tests for you automatically, including sending an improper content type, for example, right? Um, so again, we're back to loose schemas and data definitions. So this is now also at, at the parameters level and the headers level. So we'll just test all of that. And again, we'll flag all of those as part of the audits that we have seen before. Uh, so it's not only about the, the schemas, it's also about any type of data flowing through the API, right? And as we've seen uh, before, we're gonna send all these bad data formats and data types also to headers and any kind of parameters behind the scene, not just the schemas, but anything within the API that is being used uh, to pass some data in, okay? And, and as you can imagine, um, one of the side effects of the approach that we are taking actually is um, because we are interested only from our point of view in what the API actually does, right? And not so much about uh, the attacks around it, where you're focusing our efforts on making sure we describe as well as possible what is the traffic that we're expecting, which basically means something like this, which is a no SQL injection, very basic one, but just to show you an example. Um, I actually cannot make that call because this, this part here does not match in terms of the structure what the actual login is supposed to be if we were doing this properly, which is this one, right? Where we'd have a pass and a user and the pass and the user. So this, this is not matching that definition and therefore it is being rejected, right? And, and the same thing would happen if we were going to put some injection or any type of data like this inside any of the fields uh, because they just don't match what we actually expect, okay? And finally, API 9. So this is all about uh, improper assets management. Um, and um, here, there's multiple examples of that. Basically, it's all about leaving some stuff up, um, debug endpoint, testing endpoints, um, deprecated endpoints, and, and we forgot to remove them, right? So they're still there, or we have some beta endpoints. Um, we're going to talk about for, for Facebook, right? Um, and, and one of my favorite one is this Venmo thing. So I don't know if you know about, about this, but um, I was looking at that before the, um, the webinar. So those guys got hit many times by the fact that 
they actually um, are exposing, and, and for some time it was really bad. I don't know if any of you here are using Venmo, have been using Venmo, where you can see, well, that Mark K has given some money to Erica M on that date and, and is missing her. Okay, well, I guess, right? So uh, this, this, you know, it made a payment, it tells you when they have removed some data. There was a point where there was the full name here instead of an anonymized name. Um, to the point that something like a year and a half ago, a guy wrote um, a Twitter, an automated Twitter, um, every time somebody was buying drugs. Um, so they would put some, you know, key codes or whatever it was in all those transactions. So it would tweet the transaction every time somebody was buying drugs through and paying drugs through Venmo. Um, now, if you're, you know, if you look at this closely, you will see that this date here is the 2nd, 2nd, 2020, which means like since February 2nd of 2020, it seems like Venmo has stopped fielding some transactions into there. However, that endpoint is still there and alive and answering to me. So for me, that's a very good example of, I can call that API. If it has some problems, I'll be able, be able to exploit it. I don't know. Uh, but that's typical of the things that you don't want to do, right? If, if there's an API that apparently they are not maintaining because there's been no data in there for the very long time, uh, then, you know, they should just remove it from there and I should not be able to access it, right? Um, now let's talk about Facebook in here. So let's see what happens to them here. Um, so the problem Facebook got with this was on password reset, right? So basically there is a a rate limiting on the password reset on the facebook.com API, but there is no rate limiting on the beta version of it. Um, and what this allowed a hacker to do was to actually do some kind of brute force attack on, on guessing a password, um, like you know, this one time code that you're given when you do a password reset and being sent to your phone um, is being able to, to um, to take over that by simply using the beta endpoint instead of the official endpoint, okay? So why is this happening? Um, basically, again, because we have to, we forget about some endpoints. Uh, it's back to a governance issue again. We really now have to know what is it that we have. Um, and API discovery is a big problem for many of the large customers that we are working with on what do I have? Where are all those endpoints that I'm actually using, right? If you're a developer, please don't don't deploy some stuff like this with no control. Um, it, it is really a it will become a problem over time. So all of these endpoints need to be known and governed. Um, and and then you know we tend to say okay we're going to protect this protection the production stuff. We really need to protect every everything which is public and can be called from outside, could be a, a staging, a UAT, QA environment. We may be opening that for some partners to test it or external developers, whatever it is. I see that all the time. Just apply the same uh, protection and the same rules to anything which is public. And by public, it means there is a public DNS or there is a public IP, not even DNS. There's a public IP uh, that is somewhere on the internet that people can find. If there is a public IP, it will be found, it will be invoked, it will be hammered with some bad stuff. That's the way it is, okay? So you have to be very careful. And of course, separate non-production from production. That's also very critical. All right, now, what do we do about this? Well, um, as we've seen before, we're gonna integrate this in the CICD pipeline. We're gonna try to discover all your APIs and put them under control and say, this is all the stuff which is running. So you have a single pane of glass of all your APIs across the enterprise. Uh, we'll test for this unknown verbs and unknown responses. We'll block everything that we don't know by default uh, from a runtime perspective. Now, if you want, you can put also the system in non-blocking mode so you can discover some traffic. So you don't block it, um, but we will report everything we would have blocked. So it allows you to learn about all that stuff. Um, again, this is something I'm going to show it to you because it's interesting from a monitoring and logging perspective um, in, in, the next, um, in the next session. All right, and we are coming at the end uh, of the session. Um, 
So just as summarizing, um, I just wanted to give you some thoughts on what our philosophy is, okay? So in the end, we, um, we are a bit different than, than many of some of the API security companies and threat protection companies which are in the market uh, today. But we're trying not to catch problems after the fact and say, well, just do whatever you want from a development perspective and, and you know, then we'll put some magic in place at the end of the life cycle and we'll stop all the problems. I, I really don't believe in that. I, I believe in, in, in the fact that um, the earlier we put some good practices uh, in place from a security standpoint, the best is gonna be, but you need to have the right tools for doing that. And that's really what we're trying to do is to give you the tools that the developers can actually use uh, as early as design time to find all those problems, learn from them, um, and make sure that they don't pass, you know, um, the, the, the UAT maybe phase, uh, or at least, you know, very a few of them maybe can go through, but all the bulk of the problems, which are really the bulk of the problems that people have today, they have those problems because they're not covering what I call the basics, right? So analyzing user behavior and all that stuff, this is all super cool and we have to do that. But if you're not validating the contents of your data, that's not going to protect you, okay? So before looking at the advanced scenarios, let's look at the basic scenarios. And the basic scenarios are, I need to know about my data, I need to validate the data, I need to validate and find the problems as early as possible in the life cycle, right? And I need to have a visibility across the board of this is what my APIs are. We all agree, we're dev, we're ops, we're security, we're working together on this. Um, and we have the single source of truth, which is that you know, open API file that works across any API management you may have. For example, any type of framework you may have, you'll have a way to create some open API files very easily. There's some great tools around it. There's a huge ecosystem around the API, open API and Swagger. So it's not difficult to write an open API file today and maintaining it. So let's make the effort of doing that to pour, you know, thoroughly describe what our APIs do. And then as early as design time, enforce that, strengthen our security, and then you know, all, everything will come out of that. And that's really the philosophy of, uh, of what we're doing. And with that, I'll um, end this first part um, and uh, I'll take some questions, if any. All right, thanks, Isabel. We have a few questions. Um, first, I would like to address, I had a, a bunch of people asking if this is being recorded and will be sent out afterwards. The answer is yes. This will be ready later today, my time, so Pacific time. Um, I will get it up on the website and make sure all of you are sent a link. We'll also have a link to the slides as well. Uh, There's a few questions that are around the same thing. Um, it's, do you know of a tool or an app or library to test APIs using OWASP API security top 10, not the OWASP top 10 2017? So the, the API security. Top 10, yeah. There's some tool, so we are obviously doing part of that with the scan that I, I talked about. Um, that there's quite a few things that we're doing there. Um, and as part of the conformance scan, we're doing some automatic validation there. There is also a plugin for um, OWASP Zap that does some more like fuzzing. So our intention in the conformance scan is not so much to hack and, and fuzz your, your APIs for the purpose of, of attacking them. But from you know all the tests we've been doing with a lot of customers, we actually always discover some problems with the way the API is actually reacting when it's being stressed with invalid data. So we do some fuzzing um, at that level. If you want to do further than that and start sending SQL injections and scripts and all this kind of stuff, um, there is a plugin in the OWASP Zap that will be very complementary to, to what we do. Um, yeah, at, at that level, that would be the two tools I would use together to do what you're saying. Okay, next question. And um, I can also send out some information on this as well. Is Do you have any more information about how your solution integrates with Azure DevOps? Yes. 
Um, so we have this plugin for Azure DevOps uh, that I was showing during the demo, which integrates with Azure pipelines. Um, in there, you'll have multiple tasks that you can put that will allow you to run the audit um, as well as the other tasks uh, like the scan and configuring the protection directly from Azure DevOps. And I think, Christine, we have a full, uh, we have a full page on that, so we should probably yeah. put that as part of the written answers that we do afterwards. Okay, great. Um, next question. Do you know if the OWASP IoT top 10 project is still maintained as IoT is related to APIs? It is. So um, I haven't looked in, in a while, to be very uh, honest, um, but I know there is an effort there, which is kind of separate from the current uh, API one. Um, I'll have a look and, and we'll put that in the answers as well. Okay, we have a question. Um, is there any compliance or framework more specific to API security? Is there any, sorry? Is there any compliance or framework more specific to API security? Uh, compliance framework, okay. Uh, like a formal compliance framework? Not, not, not that I know of, no, but I'm, you know, maybe some somebody else has a. Not that I know of. Not something official like you know PCI DSS or something like that. When I hear compliance, that's what I I'm, I'm thinking about. <clears throat> okay, and we have one more. This is an anonymous attendee, so we cannot. If we need to get back to you after this, we're not going to be able to. <laughs> um, do you believe that best practices equates to a guarantee of absolute protection? So I'm assuming they're talking about the OWASP API top 10. Yes. Um, so, sorry, can you, uh, can you repeat that, Christine? I'm sorry. Do you believe that best practices, I'm assuming that they're talking about the OWASP API top 10, yeah. equate to a guarantee of absolute protection? Oh, well, if somebody tells you yes, they're lying to you. Um, <laughs> um, it, it is, so th there's always 100% um, in security doesn't exist, okay? So, Again, it's a layered approach. Uh, we've talked about this in, in other webinars where um, doing security and API security is not only about one thing. It's about so many things. It's about the underlying infrastructure on your system is running. It's about making sure your API is read written. It's making sure you're using the right libraries and tools. It's about putting the proper CDN and DDoS protection in front, right? So. For sure, what I can tell you, though, without going so far, what we are seeing from people we're working with is the main issue, again, is we're not covering the basics, right? So, so let's, let's stop thinking about, oh, we could do this super fancy thing to protect ourselves. Maybe, you know, in, in depends who you are as well. The risk for each of you is probably very different. If some of you is working for, you know, a, a bank of the world and, and, and the other ones working for the open weather, it is not the same risk. And your, your risk of being attacked and the risk of who is going to attack you and how is very different as well. So this is not a one size fits all here. But what I would recommend first is, okay, what do I have? What are my APIs? What is the threat protection, sorry, do a threat profile across all of that. And then, you know, decide, you know, where are our weakest point, do a review of all of this, right? Depending on your risk. And from there, then you can, um, you know, put the proper protection in place and cover the basics across all of that. And, you know, again, it's all about validating data first, inbound, outbound, control your APIs, control your schemas, control your data. If you do that, you're going to eliminate for sure, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the problems, and then you can go to more advanced stuff, and do pen testing and manual pen testing and all this kind of thing. That makes sense. 
All right, great. That's all the questions for today. And we're over time by two minutes. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Isabel, if you have any last few comments. No, thank you all. And I hope to see you again in, in a couple of weeks on Wednesday, right? Christine? November 4th. <laughs> <laughs> on, on Wednesday, which is an uh, interesting, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a fun day for anybody in America. And, uh, um, and then we'll... Uh, <laughs> And uh, we'll talk about all the rest, and in particular about BOLA and, and authorization and authentication. That will be the theme for the next one. All right, guys, Thank thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on November 4th. All right, you take care. Thank you, everyone.